I think that the NDEs are teaching, first of all, they're changing the world. And that's marvelous. We need way more, but they're really having an effect. And they're having an effect because even people who are the naysayers are having death experiences and near-death experiences. So, you know, that's a positive. Um, the other thing that happens is that it's bringing love and caring and and that's the big message that's coming back. And we need to hear that. You're listening to Shifting Dimensions. I'm your host, Jimmy Moses. On the show today is Lynn K. Russell. Lynn is the author of Beyond NDEs, The Next Step in Near-Death Research. This book discusses her research into 2,500 near-death experiences. And if you've been an active listener of the show so far, you know that we discuss near-death experiences pretty often. And just a quick reminder, near-death experiences are a phenomenon where people clinically die and their souls transition out of their body to the other side, but eventually their soul returns to their physical bodies and they continue living out their lives. No two near-death experiences are the same. However, there are many themes and similarities across these experiences that come up often, right? And some of these themes are telepathic communication, life reviews, God, heaven, and hell, time and space, and so much more. And I believe these common themes give us a potentially accurate depiction of the reality and truth of our existence. And this is why I was super excited to have Lynn on the show to discuss her extensive research into these NDE cases and her key findings. Lynn has always been a seeker of spiritual truth and she has personally experienced several transformational experiences that we also discuss in today's episode. I hope you guys enjoy this one. Let's get into the show. Hi, Lynn. Welcome to Shifting Dimensions. It's a pleasure having you here. I'm very excited to have you on the show to talk all things NDEs. And I want to start at the beginning of your book, where you talk about yourself a little bit. Um, And you said that you've always been very curious about spirituality. And I wanted to know your family's religious and spiritual background and if that influenced your curiosity. Well, no, really, actually not, because my family was uh, atheist, and um, and so no religion happened. You know, the only time they went to church was weddings and funerals. So, no, <laughs> there was no, no religion at all. And how that influenced me, that's an interesting p- perspective on it. Um, I became interested because... I was frightened of dying. You know, at eight years old, I found out about death. <clears throat> and so now I'm saying, oh, I don't want to die, you know. And um, and of course, with the atheist parents, couldn't get any decent answers. So that's what got me going. That's what got me started to, to look into this whole thing. Um, but uh, it took me a lifetime to find the answers because I didn't find the answers until I did my research, which was after I was retired. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that in your book, you you didn't start researching this until after you retired. But, you know, I found it fascinating that your family was an atheist. And I think there was a part in the book where I think your uncle had passed and you asked your mom where your uncle went or what happens after death. And I think she was just like, nothing happens. You're just kind of dead really um and it kind of made me think about myself and how I think about things too I think from a very young age I had this understanding of the fact that one day I'm going to lose the people around me and I know it's strange but even at a very very young age I had that feeling and that was part of like my deep curiosity into what really is the nature of reality what happens after death and you know, of course, that leads you down a spiritual path, which I'm, you know, clearly on. So I really resonated with your story um, in regards to that. Yeah. So 
Um, you also said that there were three spiritual transformational experiences that happened to you in 1973. And <laughs> those were really eye-opening for me. And I would love for you to share that with the audience, what those three um, transformational experiences that you encountered. Sure. Um, well, the first one, I was, they came three, the three of them came right after each other, days apart. And I sort of linked them all together because I think that it was one big message that was being given to me. Um, and so uh, the first one, I was doing the dishes and the, the breakfast and lunch dishes um, at the kitchen sink. And, and there was a the window above and I'm looking out the window and there's a tree out there and um and all of a sudden it was like I was being taken over because I wasn't seeing the tree I was seeing uh, that the tree was me and I was the tree there was no separation at all between us and whatever life forms I thought of the the you know any kind of life form um, it became me, and I became it. I didn't try an inanimate objects. Maybe a rock would be too, but I didn't try that one. <laughs> so anyway, um, and that only lasted maybe 30 seconds, and then it was over. And uh, so I'm standing there, you know, wondering what just happened and, you know, sort of in awe, actually. And I sort of felt... Um, I felt a little bit special that I had that experience because I'd heard about um, cosmic consciousness, but I didn't understand it at all. Okay, so then the next experience was a few days later, and all of these experiences were in the middle of the afternoon when the house was quiet. The older ones were at school and the little one was down for having a nap. So... That, and I think that was sort of a, a point because the spirit or the soul or whatever it was that was choosing this time knew when to choose it so I could pay attention. Anyway, so um, so I'm washing fingerprints off the hall walls and um, all of a sudden I wasn't seeing the hall wall. I was seeing an atom with the electrons like the nuclei and the electrons going around. And then after that, that expanded to um, our solar system with the, the sun and the planets going around. And that expanded to our galaxy. And so it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it was like micro to macro universe. And all the way through this, I was getting information that this didn't just happen, that there was order and planning and an intelligence behind it all. And then I got a message and it was so deep inside of me that there was no denying, but it blew me away. And the message said, this is where you came from. And this, no, wait a minute, that's wrong. That was the wrong, wrong message. Um, that message was, your being is intricately connected with the operation of the universe. So that was, that was, that was scary for me. I, I didn't like that. And as soon as I got frightened and pushed it away, it was gone. The whole thing stopped. Um, maybe it would have gone off on, I don't know. Then the next experience was again a few days later. And I'm in the living room picking up toys and tidying up. And um, I feel this presence in the room with me. And I can't see anything. All I can see is my living room. But it's so strong. It's like this blanket of love was just pouring love right into me. And I, I, I can't describe it. And um, it was beautiful. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> and um, then I felt like I was somehow connected to this being, entity, whatever, but this presence. Um, 
But I didn't see an umbilical cord or silver cord or any of that. I just felt like somehow I was connected. And then I heard words. And this is when I heard, this is where you came from and this is where you will return. And that was that was so freeing for me because of my fear of death. But the other part is that I recognized instantly that that wasn't just my message. That was for all humanity. And I think all life form, actually. So that's that was the last of my messages. What a remarkable story. Um, and it's funny that you said that you kind of got scared, especially during the second encounter um, or second experience with the message being that you're intricately connected to the universe. I, and I might be paraphrasing and that scaring you. Why did that scare you so much? Oh, I felt like I I had some kind of expectation to, to accomplish that I would never be able to live up to, that's that's why I rejected it. But but when I think about it, actually, um, it, what, what I think the whole thing, like all three of them put together, I think what they were really all about was um, oneness and talking about that everything is all one. Yes, that's definitely the message that I picked up from everything that you just described. And it's interesting because what you described, I've heard people describe having similar experiences after taking psychedelics, for example, or some people might even consider it like an out-of-body experience. So did it feel like an out-of-body experience? Do you no. think that anything specific triggered it or it just was brought upon, this experience was just brought upon you? I think so. The only thing I can think of is that before, not during, but before, I was learning how to meditate. And so maybe I had relaxed my mind enough to be able to get into that kind of, you know, I was open enough. Yeah, that makes sense. I have heard people say that sometimes when you are really able to quiet your mind, there are no other distractions. You're it sounds like you really connected to your third eye, right? Some deeper part of you, which I find fascinating. And you haven't had any other experiences since then or any sort of psychic phenomena that has happened with you. I've had many. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine it because it sounds like you have a gift. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to start talking about why you decided to start researching near-death experiences. Because I know that you started getting into this work after you retired. So what prompted you to kind of go deeper into near-death experiences? Well, what I planned on doing actually was writing a book. I wanted to be a writer after I retired. That was my ambition. I had no intentions of writing about near-death experiences. I just, I had a novel in my brain that I wanted to write. I actually wrote it, but it was horrible. <laughs> it never went anywhere. <laughs> But anyway, um, so I had this novel, and it was about a woman who asked to project it, or an OBE, but but spontaneously, and she was frightened and didn't know what it was all about, and so her spirit guide go come and talk to her, and she learned spiritual lessons, and that's what the book was supposed to be about. But there were some things that I had her doing that I wasn't sure if that was even possible in real people who actually do as astral project or OBEs. And so I wanted to find out. And so I went online to look for OBE and I ran across um, the site that turned out to be the NDERF, which is Near Death Experience Research Foundation. And that was where I wound up, but because they had a Bunch, a branch that dealt with OBEs. I never did get the answer to my questions, but that's okay. <laughs> the, the book was bad anyway. Um, but while I was on there, and as I say, I was reti recently retired. So while I was there, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at this 
this site and they've got chat line and I thought, oh, cool. So I joined this chat line and I'm part of the group. And um, so Dr. Long put out a, a message to everybody saying, I'm looking for a researcher. And I said, well, I have nothing to do, so I'll volunteer. So that's how it got to be. And of course, it was right up my alley because I wanted to know more about death. And also because I'm such a spiritual person throughout my life. Yeah, I can imagine wanting to know more about death and having the opportunity to learn and dig deeper into this and taking that opportunity. Um, because I think the idea that there's a life beyond is very comforting to a lot of people. I know that's why I started listening to near-death experience stories. And there are a few threads across these stories, right? One of the most significant threads is that when people leave their body, they go into the light, right? And what exactly is the light? Is the light a tunnel for them to get to the other side? Or is the light them reconnecting with source or the creator or higher power? Because I've heard it be described interchangeably that way. No, the sort the tunnel is completely separated from the the now the tunnel might have a light at the end that people will go towards, but that's because the light is our goal, and that's where you know we wind up going to toward. Um, but it actually, the the um, tunnel is completely separate and different. It's just a, a transportation. It's like the method that we use to get there. But there are other methods as well. So it's not just the tunnel. Um, the light, yes, the light is, is, okay, people describe the light as the source. They'll say uh, that it's it's the source. And the, the, the energy of creative force of everything that we know. And people have asked, or the souls when they're there, um, have asked, um, are you God? And they get answers like, I am the creative force, or I am the energy, or I am the, I'm the one who makes this all happen. But they don't get the words Allah or or God or Yahweh or any of those words they don't get at all. It's they it, the the source keeps itself very broad in its perspective. That's interesting because you know on Earth we have so many different words to describe that one true so source. So it's interesting that a lot of people who are coming in contact with what could be perceived as the source aren't really getting a name they're more or less getting a description of what that source is rather than an actual name is that what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah yeah it, yeah and another part is that maybe that's putting it but I think that there the light is there for us to 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 relate to to connect to to be to be there and people are pulled towards the light you know it isn't something that they say i think i'll go to the light the light has already made the decision <laughs> and they're pulled towards it it's interesting too because i know that you said in, in your book some people actually um mentioned god to be a physical person right and i'm going to quote something from your book it said it says, some say they actually did see God as an old man on a throne. They tell of sitting on his lap and their ecstasy in bliss. However, they are in minority because most see the light as the source of all we know. And everyone without exception returns, clearly stating there is a higher power. And I just kind of want to focus on the fact that some people experience God as um, an actual person or an actual being. And the interesting thing with near-death experiences is that it, it it almost sounds like people are experiencing similar things but are given different imagery to describe the same thing right because like Very you said good. okay good. 
Okay. So I, I guess I wanted to kind of get your additional insight into that and how were you kind of able to kind of decipher, okay, this is a, this is a general theme, even though people are describing it a different way during your research. Okay. Um, actually, that's very well put. Um, <laughs> I lost train of my thought. I lost train of what we were talking about. No worries. I, I guess. We recorded. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I can always cut this off. Basically, what I was trying to ask is, essentially, during oh, your... Oh, I know. I know. Okay. I got it. Okay. Um, the reason why people see... God in different forms or the, the source or whatever um, is because we create the, the experience that we have. No two death experiences are alike. They're just, they even as close as they can be, they're still different from one another. And they're as different as we are from one another. And so... Um, we may have, you and I may have a near-death experience that's almost alike, but there's variations because we're separate people. And we create the experience that we have. We are the creators of our experience. Having said that, there is also a huge pile of um, what I call universal elements, that is elements that are automatically going to be there because we've, we're soul, we're spirit, and we're at the spirit level. So just like here, we walk and we eat and we sleep and we, we do physical things or we, you know, think and feel certain things and we talk. At the spirit level, we it's universal that everybody can travel by thought or everybody can... Um, can um, can feel this love, this overwhelming love, or can see that they are one with everything that they see, because those go together with being spirit. So it's so it's a little bit confusing there, but everyone within that framework, everybody creates their own death experience and so depending on what they believe that's what they get okay just to make sure i fully understand you no two near-death experiences near-death experience are the same or no two deaths are the same for the people who pass on and end up coming back into their body but at the same time there are universal themes one of them of course people talking about the light or coming in contact with source um people talking about heaven i don't know if that's one of the We're traveling that, by thought and traveling by thought yeah, yeah. I actually I actually wrote down some of the universal stuff so the idea of not having bodies being able to communicate telepathically mm -hmm. um seeing in a 360 degree like perspective yeah, exactly. um universal knowledge no fear of death just to name a few because i think there's quite a lot there um but although these experiences might not look the same. There are certain elements that kind of ring through across all of them. But because these experiences don't look the same, someone might ask, then how do we know these are not just elaborate dreams and people are actually dying, going to the other side and then coming back? There are reams and reams and reams of information of people who come back with information they couldn't possibly know. And also the fact that they have these universal elements is a, is a you know, supports it. Um, but there are also, the ones that are favorite to me are the ones that are, um, the ones that have been dead for long, long, long time. So I'm talking 13, 14 hours and they, they often wake up in the morgue in the state of rigor mortis. And that cannot be the breaking down of the brain, hallucinations. So we need way more research. We also need more research into these phenomena that people are coming back with information that they couldn't know. 
we need we need more information we're not getting enough absolutely and i think to your point too a lot of people that i've listened to their near-death experience talk about being pronounced dead like clinically dead by the doctor or or someone who's able to assess that and then actually coming back into their body and i also think given the nature of out of body experiences or astral projection that people are able to do while being awake yes. that means that and people are having these experiences while being awake but they're not dreaming technically because they're still awake they're not sleeping right. so yeah. i feel like because that's possible then it is possible for people to or the idea of people dying physically dying going to the other side connecting back to the spirit realm and then coming back does make sense because we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Um, and speaking about being spiritual beings, having a human experience, why do we forget when we come back here? Right. Cause I think a lot of people pass on and they're like, Oh my God, it's amazing. This is our real home. Kind of like similar to the experience that you had that this is where you come came from. This is where you will return. And it's like, why do we forget? What is the purpose of forgetting? Yeah. And that goes hand in hand with the changes with people when they come back and the struggles that they have to readjust into this world. Um, one of the big reasons why we don't remember um, our life or our existence before we came into this existence, and the same thing with reincarnation, why we don't generally remember some people do but not, it's not common for people to remember their past lives and that's because we're here to live this life and it would make life, living this life very very difficult we would have a very hard time to immerse ourselves and really be here we would constantly have this yearning to be back into you know in the spirit level because it's so beautiful there and so I think that we have to have amnesia. Another thing we have amnesia about is knowledge. Um, we, we get all of this huge amounts of knowledge when we're there, but we forget it when we get back because it would interfere with our functioning here. We don't need to know that yet. We have to learn in the steps that it takes us to get there. That makes sense because you're right. I think if we had if we knew of the spirit world and where we came from and how boundless we are you know because we're not kind of trapped in these physical bodies it would be hard for us to kind of pay attention and be focused here and I actually interviewed a near-death experiencer and he said that he struggled and still sometimes does struggle with being fully present in this physical world because yeah he remembers what it was like and he kind of misses it and you know fantasizes about going back um so that's a very interesting thing that you bring up another thing that comes up a lot of uh times with these near death experiences is the life review i know that's a huge one for people um and it's really big because when we think about religion right a lot of religions talk about judgment day a day where we are going to be judged for our sins right but a lot of people say that the life review doesn't exactly work that way so I, I want to quote something else from your book um we are repeatedly told no outside force or being judges judges us during the life review they universally report we are the judge and jury so what does it mean that we are our own judge and jury um, because there's no outside force telling us, uh, and that's what we've been we've been told that there, you know, we're judged by an outside force, and that's not that not what happens. We're the ones that look at our own being and and criticize ourselves, and um, sometimes some people are really angry with themselves when when they're going through their life review. And so what will happen is that they're told, it's okay, it was just a learning experience. 
you know, not to get so upset with yourself. Um, so that's that's part of it. But the other part of it is that I believe we are one, actually one entity, to be honest. I, I think that one spiritual entity, and that is source, whatever name you want to call it. Um, and I think that that, uh, that is our reality. And so we wouldn't be we wouldn't be judged by outside forces because we are the source judging myself. You see what I'm saying? So it's like me judging my hand or my foot. Wow, that just blew my mind for a second. I was like, okay, if we're all one, we're all connected to source. We have source in us. Some could argue we are source kind of experiencing itself in billions of different from billions of different vintage points right or maybe even trillions because the the universe is so um expansive then we're in turn judging ourselves wow that gave me a lot to think about because I've heard and a lot of people say that during the life review what happens is that if you hurt someone or you treated someone poorly you feel the emotions of the person Yes. at the time when you, you know, hurt them and vice versa too. Or on the other side of that, if you treated someone with kindness, you feel their feelings of, of love and appreciation as well. So we kind of get to experience, at least from the what I've come across and from what you wrote in your book, is you kind of experience how you made other people feel versus mm -hmm. being judged. And in turn, you end up judging yeah. yourself. Um, yeah. So... When I think about that, I also think about this idea of reincarnation, right? Because I think a lot of people find meaning in the fact that if I live a good life, then, you know, I'm going to go to heaven or am, I might go to hell, right? Whereas in some other traditions, it's like if you are not living the best life, you keep coming back until you until you get it right, which in itself almost sounds like some sort of punishment for that as well. So yeah. Yeah. could you talk a little bit more about reincarnation and what your research has led you to kind of understand? Sure. Um, I think that that there is no punishment. It is simply learning and growing. It's just like school. We can't go into grade nine from grade one. We have to go through all of the different phases and, and learning experiences and, and growing and developing until we understand that one. And then we go on. But it has nothing to do with punishment. And I think that people see karma as something like you did it wrong. You just know there's no wrongness. It's just learning and growing. And that's all. Yeah, but you know, I also think about the fact that if when we cross over to the other side and we kind of connect back to, well, we're always connected to our soul and the spirit side of who we are. But when we're fully spirit and we know all, then what do we come here to learn exactly if we kind of know all on the other side? Does that make sense? We like, okay, yes, I do. Um, I think now I'm I'm growing on this one. Okay, I'm just this is something that I'm learning myself. So because I'm not one hundred percent sure, but this is what I'm thinking that when a new soul is put out into the universe, wherever it lands, it begins right from the bottom and has to as if it doesn't know anything at all. And it has to go through all of these lives and learning and experiences and gradually grow and learn more and more and more until, and I think that people like yourself and, my, and me and all the, the spiritual learners out there that are seekers um, have probably been through thousands of lives and have done a great deal of learning and growing. And so now we're at the stage where we want to know about home. Thank you for that. Um, I know that was a pretty 
loaded question. So I, I appreciate your where you are right now in regards to that. Um, and it also makes me think, you know, when we think about reincarnation, it also makes me think about time and space, right? Mm -hmm. And something that you said in your book is that, you know, people say that there's no such thing. Um, time and space does not exist um, on the other side, even though it's hard for us to conceptualize on this plane, because when <laughs> ND and near-death experiencers come back, they kind of explain their experience in chronological order in order for us to understand with our human language. But you you talk about the fact that time and space does not exist. So a lot of people have said that a lot of the lives that we're living, we are living concurrently, right? We're living at the same time. So the concept of death is also interesting, right? Because if there's a version of me that's currently living right now, but this version of me decides to transition to the other side, what does that mean in terms of the soul, right? Can the soul be in multiple places at the same time? Um, I'm going to stop there because I feel like I, I want to make sure I, I'm clear with my my ask since you know time and space does not exist but we're having these uh different live lives or reincarnating multiple times yeah yeah and um i think that we do that we do um that the soul can be in more than one place at the same time in fact it is presently now it's the soul is the ultimate soul the source is everywhere everywhere and even in the rocks <laughs> and because this because the source is is the creative force and so um and, and the creative force the, the, what i have learned about that is that um the energy that the source uses to create with is love and that love is an element of the source it's a, a a part of the source i think probably the 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 life force of the source is what i would like to put it um so it's like the chi um and so the source is putting this out all the time minute by minute by second by by second and because you and i are a part of the source and and we are the source. We are also creating everything out minute by minute by minute. And and so we can choose whatever. We can because we are a source, we can choose anything. We can choose to have multiple experiences, or we can choose to end it all and say, I, I don't want to have another life. You know, we can, it's all all. There's 100% free will. Did I answer your question? Yes, Probably you did. Not. You did. Um, I was also going to ask you, you know, since you said that reincarnation is not necessarily a punishment, it's more of like, okay, you're trying to learn. You're going from one grade to the next grade. Um, I also like that you kind of added in there that it's, it's a choice because some people say it's not a choice that we, if you don't, you know, if you have karmic debt, that you have to come back and 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 fix it but then it, it kind of confuses me too because it's again one of the laws of the universe is the idea of of freedom of choice and free choice mm -hmm. so i it's interesting that you said that cuz i don't know if everyone would um i think some people see it differently where it's kind of like you're stuck in a karmic loop i don't mm -hmm. know if you heard of or looked into the work of Dolores Cannon but she was a past life regressionist and she would kind of you know she did thousands and or maybe hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands um of of these sessions and she put a lot of her stuff her findings in in a book and what she found from the research that she did was that people get stuck in karmic loops karmic cycles where mm. they keep coming back trying to get to the next level or learn what they're supposed to learn but they they find it difficult yeah, to kind of true. learn that okay yeah, yeah. oh so, it's true okay 
So like, for example, we may need to learn kindness. Let's put kindness there. Um, we may have to have a thousand lives before we get the, that one down, you know? So that would, I think, be how she's meaning it. Okay, so it's not... So where does the free choice come in if if we get stuck in the karmic loops? We're not stuck. We're not okay. stuck. Okay. Um, we don't have to come back. We can just say, when we go back and, we're, and there's the source... We can just say, I'm sorry, I don't want to go back anymore. Okay. <laughs> but you're saying if we choose to come back, we might be stuck in, we might keep repeating the same things because we are having a difficult time because learning. we know we're... that we haven't finished that yet. Okay. We know as a spirit, as a goal, you know, we know that we haven't finished that goal, whatever the goal is. And so now there is one thing with the goals. When we, as a soul, decide to come into a life form, uh, it, and whatever life, we set, and particularly a human and intelligent life, how about that? Um, we set a goal for ourselves. And then we set all the parameters that will help us to get to that goal. And so that would be things like um, the people in our lives, whether they're people that are long, you know, like parents and, and relatives, or whether they're people that are in and out of our lives. <clears throat> whether they're best friends, that kind of thing. We also choose um, circumstances, where we live, what what nationality, what kind of race, what what uh, how intelligent, how you know what we're going to look like. What we, those kind of things we choose. Then we also choose, you know, all, everything that you can possibly think of in this existence. Oh, experiences. We choose our experience, not all experiences, some experiences. So like with people, not every person you ever see on the street is really going to connect. It's only the ones that connect with you. And the same with experiences, not every experience, but the ones that are significant in your growth will be chosen ahead of time. And then we choose our death and how we're going to leave this world as well. So that's interesting. I've heard that before, that we choose, we kind of map out our lives and we also map out how we're going to leave. And that's so hard for a lot of people when they hear that, especially mm -hmm. if they've lost a loved one, especially a loved one who seemed to have passed at a very young age in a very unfair manner. I think mm -hmm. it's hard for people to think, why would this person choose to go this way? Or, you know, yeah. like mm -hmm. some people... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I No, I shouldn't have cut you off. No, I was just going to say some people might find it hard to accept that concept because then it makes it feel like, um, not that they don't have a right to be sad, right? Because um, people will say like, oh, if someone passes away, you shouldn't be sad. That's what they, that's when they wanted to leave. Is that always the case though? Aren't there some times when people kind of, because, you know, another thing people talk about is this idea of parallel lives, right? Where you could have a parallel life where you've passed, but there's another life that you're still alive, right? As the same, kind of the same version of yourself, but just having, going down two different timelines. So then that makes me think that sometimes maybe there's some sort of interference that makes people pass away prematurely before their time as well. Okay, well, let me go back to death. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, uh, when a person dies, they can see us. They Like I hear people say, I wish my mother, father, or so-and-so was here to see this. Well, they do. They do see it. They can see you. They can hear us. They can, they know us better than we know ourselves. Um, and so... But there was something else you said that I wanted to pick up on and I missed it. Um, um, the idea of people not feeling sad because people time their passing um, yeah. or also the idea of like parallel universes and maybe a version of someone passes, but yeah. they still are alive in a, you know, tangential timeline. Yeah, Um. 
I personally have not run across anyone talking about parallel universes or, or a second. I have talked to a couple of people, and they're rare, that say that they feel that they're walk-ins. But I haven't talked to very many people who um, think that there's two of them happening. However, having said that, we're source. And source can be as many people as it wants to be in as many dimensions as it wants to be. So who knows? Who knows? It's such a it's such an intense question. Uh, but thank you for kind of, um, you know, going down that rabbit hole with me a little bit. Another thing people talk about is this sense of having heightened psychic abilities after coming back from the other side. Why do you think that is? Yeah, and that's another reason why it should be uh, that to to show that um, the death experience is real, that there's something that happened there, you know, and it should be explored. It should be looked into. Um, but yes, I and there's no explanation. Uh, some people come back with these amazing skills, and um, there's a few that I've I've read that suddenly became musicians. They knew nothing about music. One fellow wrote a symphony <laughs> and he'd never, he didn't know anything about music. So I don't know how that is. The only thing I can think of is that perhaps in his, one of his past lives, he was a musician and picked it up as he, while he was on the other side. So that's the only expert. Cause sometimes I know there was one girl and she hated math. She was just horrible in math. And so she was at college, but she was taking courses that didn't have very much math with them. And um, then she had her death experience and she was in love with math. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. And I can imagine coming back with psychic abilities because, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because, you know, we have our senses here as human beings and we have psychic abilities but when you have such a spiritual experience it makes sense that your third eye or those psychic abilities even become more heightened right oh, and yes, yes abilities that you didn't think you had all of a sudden you have them right and it's interesting that you said that the girl who came back really loving math I also heard of a near-death experience where the person came back and they were not Chinese but they were speaking Mandarin fluently they like understood mandarin like perfectly and that blew my mind right so oh. to your point there is something there it's not just a dream it's actually like an experience and yes. i think Let's... our consciousness is so vast that i think when you go to the other side you are able to like absorb or pick up something from the collective consciousness or even from your own past life experiences whatever they may have been so mm -hmm. I, I found that so fascinating um and something I have to ask you right is this concept of heaven and hell right mm -hmm. which is a big thing in a lot of near for near-death experiencers most near-death experiences experiencers talk more about the heaven side of things right even though they're you know different levels and all that stuff but also people talk about experiencing hell right so I wanted to kind of get your thoughts from your studies why do you think some people might experience a hell mm -hmm. sort of realm versus a heaven um, mm -hmm. realm and and do you personally believe that heaven and hell exist okay um no but that, but let me <laughs> let me explain. Um, hell is something that we've created. That that is a human concept that humans have evolved over. And in one of my books, I can't remember which one. Um, I go into the details of of the evolution of hell um, and how it started way back when. Um, but hell is something that was really not a big deal until Christianity came along. And Christianity used it to, as a way of controlling. And so we know the results of that. But what what pe there's people who I've, I've studied who have had death experiences who have gone to hell, 
the ones that I now the ones that I have ex, that I've researched have been taken out of hell after they've been in hell for a period of time, and they one of them said on her own, "I can get myself out of this. I don't have to be here." But almost every single one of the others had to have help being getting out of there, right? And so, like one man, I, this was sort of cute to me anyway. Um, he um, couldn't think of a prayer because he was an atheist. So he couldn't think of any prayers that, that he knew. And so what he did was, as a child, he remembered, Jesus loves me, yes, I know. And so he started singing that one, and he got out of hell. <laughs> but you don't have to do that. Because when they get out of hell, they have wound up with the light and, you know, the, the positive place. And then they ask, what was that all about? And they are told repeatedly that that was your own creation. You created that because that's what you thought you deserved. And so that's why. The other part of that is, and I think this is really sad, is our home is with the with the light. Whether they, we believe that we are the, the light and the creator or not, I don't care. Our home is with the light. And so that's where we will ultimately go eventually. And so I feel... I've read some where they refused to go to the light because they didn't feel they were worthy or, you know, they've been taught that they weren't worthy. And so they're these limbos, they're in a limbo state. And But that's because they put themselves there because they won't go to the right, the light. They refuse to, they'll see the light there, but they won't let themselves go. And so I wonder if that's ghosts. I don't know, but it's possible. And I think that's probably the saddest state of all because home is the light and they're stopping themselves from being where they deserve, where they belong. Mm. I've heard a lot of people say, similar to what you just said, that if you believe that there's a hell and if you believe that if you don't live a certain life, you're going to go to hell, then that's the experience you're going to create for yourself. So it, it seems like a lot of it is kind of, it starts with the mental, right? Because I've heard people say that we live in a very mental universe and, you know, whatever we think is what we manifest, right? So mm -hmm. I find that very interesting that you said that, but it also makes me think about the nature of our current reality, right? Where there are certain things that are good and certain things that are evil, right? Or bad, right? Even though a lot of people will say a lot of things are in between, there's not, there's, it's not really about good or bad, but in our human understanding, there's mm -hmm. certain things that, you know, if a someone was to just walk down the street and start, you know, hurting people, that's obviously we wouldn't consider that to be good. And people have also talked about the idea of different levels in the spirit realm as well, where there are low vibrational entities mm -hmm. and there are high vibrational entities. But people always talk about the light, the source is light, the source is full of love. But if if we're all part of the source, right, that means that the source potentially also created lower vibrational experiences or entities. No? no. Okay. No. We are human and we have it's sort of like a, a um here's the all the elements you go out and you play or you go out and you do your thing um and so and then i don't think god or, or the source even knows negative it, it just it just isn't part of its experience and so it doesn't recognize that there's difficulties because for for the source that's just part of learning and growing you know it's it i've given you all these tools and you go and do it um but i'm a little bit different than some people who feel that 
okay, we're part of the source, so we should stay in that level all the time. We are human. We're here for a reason. We're here for the source. We give back to the source through our existence here. And so we have a purpose of being human. And so I don't, I, we can't let go of our humanity. And as human, we have feelings and we have the, we, but we are also creators, like I've already talked about. And just like we create our death experiences, we create this life experience. Each one of us is creating the life experience that we know and that we live. And that includes the horrible things that we see. We don't purposely say, okay, I'm going to create a war. But what we do is we make choices that, that cause those to happen. So it's like the results of, you know, the consequences. Okay. So if I'm understanding you correctly, it sounds like, you know, from, from your research and, and from your own personal reflections and in you thinking about this, it sounds like whatever lower vibrational experiences we're experiencing, whether here or on the spirit realm, boils down to the fact that we all have freedom of choice, whether in human form or outside of human form, and based on those decisions, right? So for example, um, if someone, if the source gave us a knife to experience, some people might use it to cut up food to cook, right? While others might use it to cut somebody right it's still the same tool but it just depends on how you use it right that yeah. you get to kind of based on how you use it is is what kind of creates certain conditions whether they're for a higher purpose more towards love and light versus whether they're for a lower purpose and it's all an experience but it's not what you're saying is that the intention of the source the, the creator or even what people will call God is mm -hmm. not to create chaos, but we are given all of these tools and we're also given freedom of choice to experience different things and evolve the way we want to evolve. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. That's right on. But ultimately, what do you think these NDEs are supposed to teach us, right? Because a lot of people are having them. It's being documented extensively mm -hmm. and, you know, there's still a lot more research that needs to be done, but what do you think these NDEs are trying to help the collective understand? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think first of all, it's clearing up misconceptions because, excuse me, because we um, have such we, for a long, 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 long time, actually right up until the 60s, when that when the boomers came along and walked away from churches and said, you know, I want to do my own investigation, that's when it all began. And um, so from that time, people have left churches in flocks. And they are looking for their own solutions, for their own answers. And I think, I think that because we were so bogged down in negativity for so long that we needed to hear some positives. We needed to know some truths because there's a lot of stuff coming out that is not based on anything. It's just somebody's idea and they put it out there and somebody else grabs a hold of it and it flies. But it's not based on, on anything you can hold on to. So I think that the NDEs are teaching, first of all, they're changing the world. And that's marvelous. We need way more, but they're really having an effect. And they're having an effect because even people who are the naysayers are having death experiences and near-death experiences. So, you know, that's a positive. Um, the other thing that happens is that it's bringing love and caring, and, and that's the big message that's coming back. And we need to hear that. And we also need to hear that how, how unjudged we are, how absolutely... 100% love, you know, and acceptance. 
unconditionally. And that we need to know. We, we've been fed so much information about... I used to be a family counselor many years ago. And I was shocked by how many people hated themselves. I, I mean, really, it's, it's an epidemic. We have a whole society that does not like themselves, everybody. It's so rare to come across somebody who really actually loves themselves. That's a, that's a rare commodity. So that's what I think the end of years are here for. That's so interesting that you said the lack of self-love is an epidemic. And I, and I do agree, you know, to some extent, because I realized on my personal journey, the more I connected with who I was or I am as a person, the more my heart opens with more empathy and compassion for other people. Because now I'm like, oh my gosh, this is how I was talking to myself. This is how I was feeling. And this is how I was projecting all of that negativity outwards out, out, you know, outside of myself that when I see other people who are, are suffering, I just don't look at the external or their actions. I start to think I'm like, I wonder what their internal world is like, even when it comes to romantic relationships, for example, right. Um, this therapist says, you know, a lot of people are always talking about relationship dynamics and attachment theory and attachment styles. She was like the most important piece that's missing is that people don't love themselves. So they don't know how to accept love. They don't know how to give love. And if you do not love yourself, you're going to struggle in relationship with other people because you need to be able to meet yourself. You can only meet people as far as you've met yourself, right? So I 100% agree with you. And it's interesting that you mentioned truth and religion and, and, and church because I do think that a lot of religious dogma has kind of made people really scrutinize themselves in a way that's not necessarily you know, healthy. And some people mm -hmm. have described it as potentially causing some mental health issues because mm -hmm. people always feel like they're falling short of God's expectations of them. So in your research, have you, have you come across any sort of feedback on religion and the role of religion on, and like in humanity? Uh, yeah, people, <clears throat> well, people often, because we create our own, uh, experience, we often see um, the deities from our religions. So that's one thing. Um, quite honestly, the ones that I, even the ones who were seeped in a, in a religion, whatever religion, um, did not get religious messages. No, never. They did not get be told some of the things that we get told. Um, so that that was, I think, a very positive thing. Uh, people often ask, are you God? Oh, I already watched that part. Just a minute. What did they say? Oh, about religions. They'll say, um, well, which religion is the right one? And always, always the answer is there isn't a right one. Whatever one fits for you is fine. And one person asked, or at least one, maybe more, um, I remember one asking, well, why is there so many religions then? And the source just simply said, because they're different people and it fits for each person. So, but yeah. It, it, yeah, it didn't have any connotation or good or bad, or it was just business. Yes, exactly. And I don't think religion is, is bad. Like we talked about before, um, it depends on who is is using it right because I do think a lot of religions start from a very loving place and as human beings we're prone to distort things because we're just you know that's just in our nature um mm -hmm. so you know I've always kind of intuitively felt ever since I was younger that it's not a matter of what religion right it's it's more about what you resonate with right what you're able to connect with and we all speak different languages we all look different we're all one but we have different ways of understanding or perceiving the world so of course we're going to have different ways of describing source or describing yeah. you know yeah. the purpose of life for something yeah yeah exactly. exactly exactly and you know speaking of religion another thing that some nd years or near-death experiencers come back with prophecies of what's to come in the coming years. Have you done research into those and 
what were some of your your findings relating to near-death experiences coming and talking about what could potentially happen in the future because sometimes they do come off a little uh disconcerting before we go on to the prophecies which i did get some so um not ultimate but anyway i want to go just one step or one comment about religions again okay and messages that we get mm -hmm. well i think that they are passed down and passed down and passed down and that's what they learned and that's what they learned and so i don't think it's a blame thing i now maybe there are manipulators that take advantage of it and use it incorrectly but i think that a lot of people are honest about it this is what they've learned and so they're passing it on without a blame um okay so prophecy actually i was just thinking about that a few months ago this whole thing of of the the economy out of control and the extreme conditions and lining up for food and that kind of thing and the 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 um, soup kitchens and things like that that was prophesized it was prophesized repeatedly i read it i don't know how many times and so the message would come back and say this is what's coming but of course who listens <laughs> And so here we are. And it said, I remember distinctly that it said with this one, you need to change what you're doing, you know, and that's happened repeatedly. I hear that change. You need to change. You're heading for trouble, you know. So, and we do need to. We do need to very much. Um, but the thing is, I did, now I have read some or talked to some who have said, here's what i what the prophecy was but there, it's all going to work out in the end so just have some faith that it'll be okay that's good because i think sometimes when i think about prophecy i always like hold my breath because it just feels like where's the hope in all of it right because i think at the end of the day we need to be real about there are things in the world that are not pleasant to experience. And, you know, with, with prophecy, sometimes it's kind of like a warning for the collective to, like you said, change certain patterns, become more present, connect more to the spiritual side of who we are, because yes. I think life works in cycles, right? I've heard so many people talk about um, the different cycles that we go through in humanity. And I think sometimes with a lot of people's consciousness being raised and a lot of people starting to ask questions and have conversations like this okay. is because we're supposed to be leaning more into mm -hmm. these conversations and thinking more into um, how we live our lives, right? What matters to us? Because I think the way we're living um, in terms of just immersing ourselves nonstop with work and technology is no longer sustainable because we're not um, we're not machines. We're human beings or we're spirit beings having a human experience. And I think we're being called to connect as a spirit side of us so that we can have a greater capacity to love because with the violence that's going on in the world, again, that is also not sustainable and in the long term could be detrimental to our existence as human beings but the hope is that a lot of people are again waking up and and really connecting to that love or that you know that we light to, in all of us yeah we need to get rid of all the old men in politics <laughs> i'm telling you the truth i'm an old woman i'm saying it they're just stopped, stuff is steeped in their own power. And the new generation that's coming up from the millennials on is with it. They're they're alive, they're bright, they and they they have a different mindset. Absolutely. I agree with that, Lynn. Thank you so much. This has been such an amazing conversation. Um, and just so we covered so much. So I appreciate you for doing the research, putting this all into a book and just in some ways spreading the good news right um so thank you so much and to close out the show before i can i ask you where people can find you or get your book 
I would love to know if you've shifted in perspective on anything recently and it could be as lighthearted as you you want. Maybe you discovered a new dish or a new book or it could be as deep as you want it to be. Sure. Okay. I think what I want to end talking about is thought. If you really think about it, every single thing in your life is based on thought. Every decision you make, what, what, where you are right now in your life, where you're going, everything is based on thought first. So thought is so vitally important and we don't realize it. We, we just fluff off our thoughts. We think, oh, oh, but they really are vitally important because that's where it leads you to your next place and your next place. And if people can think back of they married the wrong person, they're in the wrong job, they're, you know, they, uh, the things that are wrong with their life, if they think back, it's because of a decision they made. So that, so we really need to be aware of our thoughts very, very, very much. And that's the most important thing that I want to say. There is one last thing. The book is the Beyond NDEs, um, the next step in near-death experience research. And where can people find your book or if they want to connect with you and learn more about your work? I'm really easy to find. Just Google my name, but be sure to put Lynn K. Russell. You have to have the K in there or you won't find me because every single Russell family in the world has got a Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's awesome. I'm going to link, uh, I'm going to put the link to your book and the website in the show notes. But thank you again, Lynn, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Guys, just a friendly reminder that if you are enjoying the show, please make sure you subscribe, make sure you rate, leave a review, engage with us. Honestly, your engagement, your subscriptions, you sharing helps to bring visibility to the show. And if you're enjoying it, please show the show <laughs> some love. And if you want to continue to rock with us, you can follow us on TikTok at Shifting Dimensions 444, or you can follow our YouTube page or subscribe, I should say, to our YouTube page at Shifting Dimensions. You can find us there. Thank you again for tuning in. See you next time.